Welcome back. So I'm sure all of you saw this news story, right? Um, so obviously this is banking off of another recent news story. Um, Delta thinks that it's come up with this brilliant idea uh, that's going to work well for them. And you know... Um, Oh, this is interesting. Okay, so Delta and United are taking two different approaches. I didn't actually fully read the story uh, before I started the stream, so we're doing this live. Um, so it says Delta's letting employees offer customers uh, nearly that much in compensation, hoping to avoid an uproar. United is taking steps as well. Um, I don't so much care about the United story because that's controversial and no amount of game theory is going to solve that problem. Um, so, yeah, overselling flights is certainly a fact of life in this business. Um, okay, so there's no nothing more as far as game theory goes. Um... um so here's the deal um this sounds like an excellent idea by delta um it sounds like they could you know make this deal because uh, realistically if one person says that they'll give up their seat for that amount of money the person next to them will give it up for a penny less and the person next to them a penny less than that, and so on and so forth. Um, I think, I mean, this is a pretty classic game theory problem. Where this gets interesting is what if a collective of people booked all of the seats of a flight and overbooked it? So... I don't know how many seats you could manage on the largest possible aircraft. Um, I guess we'll say 200 or so. You know, I bet Delta's run the numbers too. So if you estimate, I don't know, 50 to 100 for a flight, if all the seats are booked all at the same time, 50 to 100 per seat times um, 200 seats or so, yeah, uh, it seems like they've actually done the math. So, yeah, anybody looking to game this would not only need to have that entire collective of people um, completely unilaterally in agreement against Delta to not give up their seat for anything less than that number. Um, but you'd also need to manage to overbook the flight without Delta noticing. But, you know, that said, I'm sure some people will try. We'll see how far they get with that. In reality, it won't come down to that sort of showdown situation. But if somebody actually managed, um, if some collective did uh, agree to this in some sort of binding agreement and managed somehow to for everybody in that group to say that they will not settle for anything less than that number, um, then there could be a payout. But that would be just as expensive like to reserve the entire plane um, as it would, I don't know. There's still got to be some way to cause some kind of fun with this, but yeah, unless you can get a collective of people all completely in agreement and somehow Delta overbooks the flight and doesn't notice that this collective is after them. Um, yeah, it seems like Delta's actually run the numbers. Right, exactly. It's the same concept where you buy all the lottery tickets or as many as you can. Basically, well, I guess you'd have to buy them all and you share the winnings and that sort of thing. 
But yeah, now this number actually seems like um, something in the right range where it would cost you about that same amount to reserve the entire plane. Um, still, I don't know. I think somebody is going to try that idea. I can't be the only person to have thought of this. And it just seems interesting to explore from a game theory perspective. Um, but the more I look at it, yeah, deltas actually run the numbers. That's what really got me puzzled about this, was how did they come up with that number? Um, I suppose the way they did it is by multiplying the average seat price times the number of seats. And so even if they F up, all it costs them is a single flight. Um, plus they control all the other factors such as, I don't know, whether or not they say they're going to run the flight due to weather restrictions and so forth. So they have various ways of shaking up that sort of um, group. I still think it's an interesting problem. but. You know, if they'd put a higher number on there, like a million uh, per seat, I'm sure more people would come up with this idea and the people would actually find a way to game it. Um, but yeah, at this number, the, they're probably a safe doing this. Um, I think one thing that was mentioned in the CNN coverage of this is that um, Delta is also going to be uh, allowing gate agents to offer greater numbers and compensation at the gate just for people not getting on the flight in the first place. Um, which I'm sure will entice people to, um, I don't know. It's probably easier to convince somebody to go once they're not on the craft. And once they're on the craft, it's probably a lot harder just emotionally to um, get them to reconsider. Uh, I started this stream thinking I had a good idea, acknowledging that other people have thought of it, and then I realized, oh wait, Deltas actually run the numbers, and yeah. It was still a fun idea though. I wonder, are there similar uh, fields where there are arbitrage opportunities like this? I mean, I'm sure it happens in big business all the time, but is, are there opportunities where um, just average people, um, people who don't have, I don't know, who don't own a big business are able to play that? Yeah, I know. It just seemed like this would be the sort of impulse reaction that um, people, um, that a PR group would come up with, and that some executive out on vacation said, oh, that sounds fun, and just lets it go. But yeah, no, Delta's um, uh, smart enough that they will have at least come up with some sort of damage estimation, and they probably even have an insurance policy for this sort of thing, if I had to guess. Now, as to whether the insurance underwriter messed up the math or not, and it's going to cost the insurance company, who knows? Um, but no, it's probably done by the books. But yeah, I wonder, are there similar situations where people uh, have opportunities to mess with something like this. I don't know. It could be interesting, but... Man, thought I had it. All I had to do was like multiply the number of seats on a plane by the cost of a seat and realize that even if they screwed up, it's not going to ruin their day. Um, now, if they were to overbook an aircraft by like 10 seats or something, 
Um, that might have some impact on their budget. Um, but they're not going to do that. They'll notice if something's up like that. Hmm. I bet the one thing that they haven't thought of, though, is what if this collective um, are people just waiting outside the gate before you've boarded the aircraft? Could people unionize at that point? Um, saying that we won't give up our seats for less than a given number. Granted, these people would need to know somehow that the flight's been overbooked. But if you knew that the flight was overbooked, because most are, and you knew that everybody had shown up to the gate, uh, you'd have an information advantage over Delta. So I guess that's the opportunity, is um, the sooner that people can identify before De Delta identifies it, that a flight's been overbooked and um, subject to condition where the weather is not in any way impeding the flight, um, people could actually make a buck or two. Uh, a person could even make like a mobile app that runs on like Android and iPhone and so forth to help people collect and um, get money for giving up their seats. You could probably make a buck releasing the app before it gets kicked out of the store. Um, as for whether the app would actually work or not, probably not. Even if it did work, um, I'm sure that the airport would find some way to either participate as users of the application or monitor the application. So you'd have to like encrypt it and um, I don't know. A lot of analysis would have to go into it. The person making the app would probably make some money. The people buying the app or using it and seeing ads or whatever probably would not make any money. In fact, as I'm thinking of this, probably somebody's already made an app and is trying to make money based on ads or purchases. And it'll probably get kicked out of a store, at least out of the Apple store. Um, I don't know if Google would kick it out of a store or not, but or remove it from their listing. But I don't know. And so if you couldn't do it as an app, you'd have to do it as like a third party website or RSS feed or something. And um, I don't know how it would all work. And as soon as you found a way for it to be effective, Delta would just change their number. So instead of being like 10,000, it'd be like 5,000 or 3,000 or something. And I don't know. Delta would probably even purchase um, the person or company that made such an app and um, use that for actionable intelligence within their selling and ticketing and so forth systems. So, I don't know. Seems like a fun project for somebody with the computing resources of um, like Google DeepMind or such, but probably not in the realm of something, I don't know, like a group like Improv Everywhere would do. So yeah, that's numbers, math, game theory, legalese, and technology in a nutshell. Um, hmm. Well, I guess that brings us to whatever the next subject is. Um, I did have one other thing I was discussing this morning. Um, I was actually going to the Leeches forum to discuss this. So, um, where was it? Where was it? Oops, uh, that's not what I was looking for. Um, yeah, so we were discussing Swiss tournaments. That looks kind of fun. Um, but what else was I discussing? 
Um, <laughs> oh, this is fun. Uh, okay, so this this all starts uh, from a game where um, one player has a knight, the opponent has a pawn, and a checkmate can, in fact, be constructed. It seems unlikely, but it's possible. Um, you know, this probably would have gone better for Black if he didn't promote the pawn right away. Um, and instead just like race the king over here to support the promotion and then actually this would have gone best for black if he just brought the king over to the queen's side took the knight then promoted um pretty much an instantaneous victory but black wasn't paying any attention because why would you pay attention why i mean if your opponent is like moving their knight toward your pawn Actually, I guess, I guess the knight was in front of the pawn to begin with, but I guess black just doesn't know end games. Um, that's okay. Um, so yeah, I guess he zugzwanged here. He goes after this pawn, which is fine. And he starts running away from his other pawn. And he doesn't recognize that if he just lands his king on c3, that just wins on the spot. Um... So okay, I guess this does require a little bit of endgame knowledge, so Black messed up. Um, but because Black messed up, and because White has mating material, um, this was decided as a win for White. And um, so it was proposed that we should use endgame table bases to figure out who wins. And I'm like, mm, that doesn't seem right. And so there's some discussion going back and forth and 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 forth and back and back and forth. And it's mentioned that, you know, if Black had just a single second for every move, he wouldn't have lost the game. There's no way he would have fallen for the checkmate. And I'm like, yeah, but Black didn't have one second per move. If black had an increment, this wouldn't have happened. Um, and then so he's saying, well, okay, but the endgame table base says that black can't lose this. And I'm like, yeah, but we're talking about humans, not endgame table bases. We're not talking about engines. So, um, and so then he calls the rule unfair because Black wouldn't have lost that if he had time to move, which he didn't. Um, and he's saying that his endgame table-based strategy would sometimes be unfair, which I've already explained to him that people don't play like in um, this, and he's just repeating what I said, but that's okay. Um, and he's just talking about are the rules fair or not, and I'm saying like, well, the current rule's fair, and... All right, so let's see if we can have a real discussion here. Um, and he's referencing the FIDE rules, and I'm saying, well, no, we're not looking to do FIDE rules. And he's asking me, oh, I actually pointed out, like, his interpretation of FIDE rules are wrong because in this position, neither player is able to move because a checkmate is not possible. Therefore, the game is declared a um, a draw immediately. Um, it's illegal for either player to move in this position according to the FIDE laws of chess because no checkmate can be constructed. Um, and um, what should happen in that situation is the arbiter should stop the game immediately. Um, and so... Um, I explain, yeah, all we're trying to do is just make sure if a player can't checkmate, or sorry, if they can checkmate, it's a win. If they can't, it's a draw. Um, and so, and he's saying, according to my rule here, uh, this game here should be a draw. Um, and I'm saying, yeah, actually, you're right that by the rule that I suggested, neither player can force a checkmate um, 
white's time elapses, but black is unable to checkmate white, so this should be a draw. I definitely agree with that. Um, and he also argues with my interpretation of the FIDE rules. Um, so I explain the FIDE rules to him in clear detail, saying that um, position where neither player can checkmate is in fact a dead position. And um, my goal is not to do the FIDE rules, and I'm not sure why you brought that up in the first place, other than they sound quite similar. Uh, another player suggests... Um, yeah, in fact, I explained that I have an explanation elsewhere, agreeing that, yes, a position where neither player can checkmate um, should be a draw when one player's time elapses. Um, so another guy suggests, well, this do something that we were doing in the past. If a lowly 1600 rated player could figure out how to not be mated against so little material, we declare the game a draw. Um, and so I say, okay, fine. What do you mean by that? So, fun little discussion. Just keeps going and going and going. Um, and then we got a little more discussion here. Um, he constructs this really silly position where uh, White's not able to move any of his pawns because it would be stalemate. And he's saying, like, the evaluation result of Stockfish is incorrect because uh, it should be zero and plus 86 is just wrong, in his opinion. Um, and so he says that uh, his Houdini got to a zero evaluation. Therefore, um, uh, because Houdini gets a number, Stockfish should have the same number. And, you know, he's right that this position is draw, I think. Um, and I said, well, you know, why should Stockfish say zero? Anything that's not a mate score is just an opinion. I mean, really what matters is not the number, but... Um, what's what moves that Stockfish recommends um, and I don't know that I even understand this necessarily oh I'm sorry the pawns are going this way uh, they're going down the board so this board is flipped okay that makes a lot more sense um, yes yeah, so it's saying that uh, Stockfish should recognize that this is a draw. Um, um, insufficient time for analysis. Hmm. Um, okay, so maybe there is one point that I can glean from all this. And that's that even though... Um, a checkmate is not possible. Um, perhaps there may be a concept that um, Stockfish has evaluated all the possible moves in a position and exhausted the search tree, and there's just no way to win this. Um, interesting. If Stockfish comes up with such an evaluation, uh, then there's no need to ask it for evaluations in the future. Um, so that's not a stockfish bug, that's a leech us bug, technically. That the stockfish is able to somehow say that I've searched to depth one billion and this is just a draw and there, it really doesn't matter what you do. Um, Actually, the way the stockfish could best return that, if we really cared about it, and I don't think we do, um, but if we cared about that sort of thing, then stockfish should just say, I've analyzed this to depth 200 something. Here is the drawing variation. Oh, but that won't stick. 
because like if I say king b2 is the drawing move, I can only give one black move here. Um, really what I need to identify would not be positions where with best play it's a draw, but with any play the only possible result is a draw. Um, so interesting. Timeout white is victorious. <clears throat> Ultra bullet. Huh. So that maybe there's a way to um I mean, yeah, it's an enormous move tree. Um but you don't care about the tree. All you care about are the positions and the size of the hash table. Um, so we'll say that none of the white pieces can move other than the king, and only the black king can move. So the size of this hash table would be, well, let's say white's king can be on any one of 51 squares, right? The bottom six rows, which ranks one, two, three, four, five, six, plus these three squares. So White's King can be on any one of 51 squares. Let's just round it down to 50. And we'll say Black's King can be on any one of 50 squares. So the size of the hash table with either player to move would be 50 times 50 times two. Um, so there's only 5,000 positions to analyze. None of them are checkmates and some of them are stalemates. Many of them are illegal, um, but yeah, this is a fun experiment actually. I like this position. Um, this is a really fun test position. Uh, I actually don't know, huh, I think it's just for standard chess, not for from position games that cloud analysis is an effect. Um, hmm, interesting. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, what I wanted to do is grab this FEN, copy it, um, is there a cleaner way I could do this? Yes, I don't need that FEN. Um, I could do one that has just bishops. Hopefully that could reproduce the same um, result. So one second while I log in. I have to touch my mic here, forgive me. Hopefully that wasn't too bad. Uh, so... I think I'm in. Okay. Let's put my tabs together so we can all see what I'm coding. Um, copy that. Uh, clear test.txt position fen this thing. Except that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for, well, go depth 200. Cat test into stockfish. And this should say, um, it's evaluating this as 86 pawns better. Let's try a simpler example, like I was saying. Um, so after setting the position, we're just going to make the whole back rank bishops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Going to make the whole next rank pawns. White to move. Depth 200. So pretty clear that nothing can move in that position. Um, once we hit depth 100, Stockfish will recognize that its principal variation is not mate. Um, uh, 
I picked bishops because all the bishops move the same way. Um, so that should make it simpler to do the move generation. Oh. Um, what is this? I'm not sure what you're asking. So we're looking at this position. Let me flip it. Uh, I thought F was flip. Yeah, there we go. White to move cannot win. Um, black to move may be able... Uh, well, no, black to move draws. Um, sorry, I was thinking about a different position for a second. Um, so, okay. When we hit depth 90, that's when Stockfish recognized that it's just not winning this. Oh, you got a Steam game. Interesting. Um, I'm curious if if the name of the game is something appropriate. Moonbase Alpha. Well, I guess I'm curious what this involves. Um, let me first check if this is something appropriate or not. Hopefully it is. Okay, that looks... Why would you do this if you have KSP? Uh, well, let's see. Is this... Oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah. No, this reminds me of um, another game. That's cool. Uh, requires a third-party EOLA, but as long as it's not with, like, EA or somebody um, ridiculous, that seems okay. Um, developer is Virtual Heroes, an army game studio. The publisher is NASA. That's pretty nice. I'll check that out. Um, turn on text to speech and settings. It gets better. Huh. So sorry, I, I didn't actually do, uh, expect to go on this digression here. Um, oh, here's a funny thought, right? Um, you know how you give these settings to the engine and tell it it has um, like 50 half moves until the draw. Just change this number a bit. Just like add 40 to it and see like how quickly it recognizes a draw. Wait, what? Oh, I'm sorry, that's not the half-move clock. The half-move clock's the other number. Um, wait. Wait a minute. What am I missing here? In this... Like, that last number is the turn number. The number before that's the half-move clock. Oh, it's half-moves. Um, so yeah, let's just set that half-move counter to 90 arbitrarily. Okay, and see that if we had only 10 half-moves to go, it's a draw. Um, so then I can bump this down, like, 50 and see if I say go depth 100. Um, okay, that actually takes significant time. That is funny though, it goes through the first 48 and then it's like, wait, I don't have any feedback for you. Um, mm -mm -mm. What happens if I change the half move clock to 90 and I say go, go depth 100? I know I just changed two factors at once here. In fact, I don't need this all bishops position either. Um, yeah, so we'll operate with the one that was in the diagram. Um, so in most positions, if you bump the half move clock way up just arbitrarily, um, 
you will still get a correct result. <laughs> so, um, hmm, how do I, okay, first of all, what was the last move here? Last move would have had to been white promoting, or we'll say that black captured a piece. Um, and so that starts the 50 move clock. Maybe, I wonder, if you have a position where one player has only a king, um, what's the greatest the half move clock can become uh, before we acknowledge that it's a draw? Like, if you have only a king, I guess king, bishop, and knight can take like 30 moves or something. Um, hmm. Um, what makes this trickier is that if you had a different position, like if I were to put a bishop where this queen is at the moment, then there might be a position where black puts his king on a7, and white puts the king on b5, and black... Wait, no, there's still no capture. Um, uh, but, yeah, I'm just saying there might be a way to construct a position where black captures some things, and then dooms himself. Um, uh, yeah, I guess what you would have to do would be, like, put a bishop here, and then black moves the king and takes the rook. Um, and then, I don't know, moves the king away after doing all that. Um, not very realistic stuff. But maybe there are some positions where if you understand that neither player is able to do a capture, you can set the half move clock to a minimum of um, 40. Um, because I think the longest mate. Uh, well, no. There are some checkmates which take greater than. but they have captures. Uh, longest checkmate, no capture. Um, because there are some checkmates that require multiple captures in the sequence. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Longest table base checkmate no capture? Nope. Okay, here we are. Just have to know how to ask the right question. Um... Man, they asked the right question and the chess.com forums blew them off. That's too bad. What's the longest table base mate with a unique optimal line? See, but this involves a capture at some point. Um, I want the longest sequence where uh, there's no capture in the sequence. I don't know. I have to give that more thought at some point. Hmm. I wonder what the longest forced checkmate um, in game no capture, no pawn move is. If we assume the longest forced checkmate is 30 moves, 60 plies, then, then Leechus could 
Um, set the half move clock. Uh, and what? Then Leech Us could detect this and um, set um, the FEN half move clock to minimum um, to at least 100 minus 60 equals 40. For any position such as, and then we have to go find a leeches editor, set up a position. We'll be getting to some Steam games soon. That'll be good fun. And put a Black King somewhere out here and put this into an analysis board and ask what's the solution. Um, oh, wow. Okay, yeah. So this is like mate in 57. Good enough. Oops. Uh, how do I take this back to the editor? Okay, here we go. Copy that. Um, could use a half move clock of 40 rather than zero. Um, good enough. Idea articulated. Uh, all right, so text to speech in Moonbase Alpha. Well, let's check it out. New tab. Exit that. Moonbase Alpha text to speech. Oh. Wait, what? Huh. Within two years, the video received over 103,000 views and 230 comments. Wait, is this the... I saw some game where people were making a text-to-speech engine say things that were inappropriate. Um... It's got on text to speech, or actually they're making it like sing songs too and do silly things. Um, okay, there's a lot of good fun that can be had there though. Anti troll command. <laughs> uh, okay, but yeah, that's still a cool game. I'll experiment with that sometime. Don't know when. I'm still confused. I thought I had Nightbot here. And I thought Nightbot like blocked all links. So I'm really confused. Just that I'm seeing the link at all. But that's okay. I can always bother uh the night dev at some point. Um I guess I Oh, let's go to about one other point I had on Lee Chess. One F3 Atomic Chess. That seems, oh, that seems actually okay, since Black plays one F6 all the time. It can't be too dangerous. Um, yeah, well, I don't know. I'd actually rather do KSP. Um, I just need to experiment with that sort of thing first and make sure that there's no way to exploit it in some way that, I don't know, really messes everything up. Um, I'll take a look at that, but I'm not ready to dive into it just yet. 
Um, I actually saw there was a stream this morning of somebody trying to do some AI learning in KSP and have a Python script that automatically guides the rocket, which is pretty cool. Um, thankfully, they're probably a good person, researcher sort of person, and not located in some third world country looking to do stuff and simulate it. So, <laughs> um, uh, let's see, what was the other thing? I forgot my other point. Oh yeah. So there's this group out here, coders. It has like 115,000 tournament points. And I don't know how many people are in here. A lot. There's a lot of people. They're all cool. Many of them are busy. But um yeah, insistence of other developers on the Stockfish project, and after some reflection, I'm like, you know, I should just let people know this is out there. If people think that uh, they have a way that they can patch Stockfish to work better, by all means, have at it. And just, like, create a test here, hit the new button, follow the instructions that are provided, um, I guess on the wiki for uh, this code repository and if the changes pass the tests then there's a pretty good chance I'm gonna merge them. I'm not actually sure how the Python people did uh, or um, did that AI learning. I'm not sure what kind of model that uses although neural network seems to be all the rage these days but I don't know. Um, so, yeah, you can see, like, look at my test that I just ran just yesterday. It crashed and burned pretty badly. That tends to be a recurring theme with, like, half of these, by either myself or by other people. It's pretty rare that I come up with something that works. Um, just kind of annoying because all I'm trying to do is just make it better. And honestly, it would be more fun developing if I could just check in my changes and be like, oh, that looks good. That was kind of um, the initial approach where just do things by the seat of your pants and just see um, uh, whether it seems to work or not based on a few sample test positions. Um, you know, we're doing things a little bit more formally now. This thing, yeah, you're right, this green patch is pretty epic. Um, you know that because the number, the first number says the number of games here. All these tests tend to pass or fail with a plus 2.97 or minus 2.97 because that's the significance test. Um, I think that's Pearson's test or T, uh, student t-test. Um, but we're doing this with um, doing two tests at once to see uh, which is more likely. Is it more likely that the patch um, fails, it produces a significant regression, or is it more likely that it passes, that it produces a significant improvement? And the number of games in which it produced the improvement is under 2,000. So um, these tests can go up to a lot of games. Um, it's not uncommon to have a, a test that goes for a long time. But this one ceased at 2,000 or 17, 19 games. That was the slow time control. For a faster time control, it took like 2,500 to notice any effect or to prove that it works pretty well. Um, in which case, you assume that it's more likely that it's an improvement than it's a uh, problem uh, or a regression. Uh, you can't really prove it for sure without um, a lot more math, a lot more data. But you can say you're pretty reasonably confident that this is a good thing, this is a good thing. Uh, as for what that green patch consisted of, you can look at, like, 
Um, <laughs> I was going to say, you could look at all the other developers who helped me develop this, but in this case, uh, I ended up rewriting so much of their code. It was still based on their ideas, but I wrote all the code in this case. Um, this is the biggest part of this change. Uh, these numbers changed a lot where uh, I introduced the idea here that, you know, maybe instead of just checking, do I have a pawn, bishop, knight, rook, or queen, we could just check, do I have a piece in my hand? And if I have a piece in my hand, how afraid should my opponent be? Doesn't matter what the piece is. And so that now has a value of 87. So just the fact that you have anything in your hand is enough um, that your opponent should be worried. Um, it doesn't really matter what kind of piece it is, turns out. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is that just having something in hand can be useful to block any attack that they um, launch against you before you launch your own attack. Oh, IRL just means, uh, it's a new category in Twitch. It means that I can basically say or do whatever I want here, as long as I'm engaging. Um, or at least that seems to be how it's handled. They have a more formal policy on exactly what it means, but it means that I don't have to be playing chess, I don't have to be coding, I could just be talking. You can just be hanging out, and then when I want to play a game, I can change um, that to like chess or backgammon or go, reverse e, scrabble, I just change it to whatever, and then get listed under uh, that kind of portal. Um, so well, uh, I was mentioning with that green patch we were just looking at here, just click diff, and you can look at the code change. This is a pretty nice simplification. Uh, the reason I simplified this is because for games other than Crazy House, we don't want to be checking, is this Crazy House? And uh, why does this work now? Why can I just check, um, do they have a queen, as opposed to do they have a queen or is this Crazy House? Well, it's because for Crazy House, I redefined. Um, the function that says uh, do they have a piece and now it includes pieces in hand um, and I also redefined the function that counts all of the pieces um, and this is other people's idea they came up with different ways of coding it I came up with this way I don't know there might be a more performant way to do this like I might be able to add a template parameter here that says what variant the variant is. And then say if the variant is crazy house, then execute this code, otherwise execute that code. Um, as it is right now, it's hard coded to check this, but the compiler has ways of moving around the code and combining um, branches of code together. So hopefully it's doing a pretty good optimization, but if not, maybe I've got to add a parameter into this uh, list of template arguments to say what kind of variant we're doing this for. Um, and fun fact, um, so we got the search routine. Well, this checks like are the number of pieces few enough that we can engage the table bases, and now um, for standard chess, we can fall in here all the time. For crazy house, we're always going to have a position that has more than six pieces. Um, nobody's going to set up, in fact, in Lee Chess, you're not able to set up a crazy house game that has six or fewer. So for Lee Chess, we're A-OK, -okay, perfectly safe, never going to fall into this. Um, but for normal chess, we got to get rid of an if statement. Um, yeah, I don't know where you're looking, but um, if that's a problem, I guess I could switch it to something else, or just say I'm not playing at all, but uh, I'll have to think more about that. Um, 
So yeah, I think that's that. Uh, to get this change working, to get these other changes here tuned correctly, and this to work, I had to tune some other numbers and some more numbers and some more numbers. And I have to type all this in by hand. It's really annoying. Uh, even though these numbers are generated by, um, they, I don't come up with these numbers. These numbers are generated by, let's go to the crazy house patches. Um, here's the test that came up with all these numbers. Um, I wrote a small script, fed it some input, it came up with these outputs. Here's a graph of how these numbers changed before and after the session. If we get rid of the top line of this graph, you can actually see that all the numbers are moving around a lot. If you get rid of like basically all the lines on this graph, except for the bottom few, um, you can see exactly what changed. Um, so let's just keep, unfortunately, oh, wait, no. I was going to say I can't multi-select here to get rid of... Oops, did I break it? No, I didn't. Oh, that is super unfortunate. Takes me back to the top of the list every time I... Okay, this could take a while. Fine, I'll just show you individual parameters here then. Uh, King Danger. So here's that number that I changed from zero that says if I have any piece in hand, this is how much um, I should consider that to be worth. Um, and that's just pretty helpful in general. Um, if you're really curious about the code that produced these numbers, oh, that's not it. Uh, is this gonna work? Yeah. You have to get rid of the word constant and you have to use, um, I think Marco Castalva came up with this coding technique. Um, so you're able to say, I want to look for numbers between these bounds that have, uh, affect this array of values. And likewise for other arrays, get rid of the word constant. These changes didn't actually need to be in play. Oh, I don't know. I'm not sure about some of that. but. You use the same concept where you say I'm going to tune these constants and these constants and these and those. Um, oh, and one other thing, and hopefully I did remember to do this on the master branch. If not, shame on me. Uh, don't give bonuses for um, pawns um, the way we do just normally. You have to use uh, instead the quadratic formula for pawn bonuses, which is defined. Where is that? I want to. No, that's pieces in hand. This is our pieces. Yeah, I don't know. It's supposed to be like this number here. Or I'm sorry, this one. Where we say if we have a pawn and we have another pawn then based on the number of pawns um, times the number of pawns give this kind of bonus. Um, did I make that change on the master branch though? If not, I have merged this incorrectly. Um, let's see, where is that? I'm not seeing that. Uh, okay, what am I looking for? I'm looking for... I think I might have messed up. Looking for this here, this pawns set on line 360. Where is 360 in this? It's going to be in evaluate, or I'm sorry, material.diff. 360 is down here somewhere. Has this already been merged? That's not good. Um, <laughs> ah, this is why we do code review. Oh my goodness. 
So it's possible I might have merged something that didn't match up. Oops. Um, okay, so what's the current state of that file? Source material uh, pawns set. Damn it. Um, well, got to go fix that. That's a bit embarrassing. Uh, so, whoops. Um, so, here, and then get this tab over. We'll fix this bug. Um, stockfish here, room material that CPP pawns set. If the crazy house and if uh, if whatever that condition was bonus equals zero. I think it was position that is house, right? This is what we were looking at here. We we're saying tune all the values. Oh wait. Wait a minute. So this diff, this diff didn't include that change, did it? So, okay, this diff did pass testing. So what I need to do, um, let's create a new branch and see, is this gonna pass testing too? Um, I really wanted this to be part of that change, but it wasn't. It wasn't what I tested. So if I'm going to change this, I do need to test the change. <sighs> okay, we can test that. Uh, get branch, get checkout new branch. Um, crazy house on set. Diff and uh, material commit for crazy house variant do not use pawns set bonus. Um, did I have a? I don't have a task number for this, do I? Or an issue number? Okay, what recently changed here? I thought I had, yeah. Uh, crazy House Quadratic and King Danger formulas. Yeah, so number 172 is um, the issue we're referencing. Uh, clear make build, just make sure it compiles. And we'll get to gaming soon. Oh, so soon. But yeah, I do tend to use this um, stream category when I'm not entirely sure what I'll be doing other than talking. So, uh, I still have that tab open in the background of my computer um, saying that I've got to do this advent of code challenge at some point. And what, it's been like three and a half months since, well, four months since Advent. Um, four months since December. So, <laughs> we'll get to it, don't worry. Just give it time. Maybe we'll get to it by next December. Maybe sooner, maybe later. I'm sure there's plenty of games to go uh, do. Um, so, if I run this... Does it run? If it runs, I haven't broken anything significant. Git push origin new branch. And say that's good to go. Um, I gotta 
uh, create a new test. Um, say it's going to be for crazy house. Here's the branch number. Uh, don't need that. Don't need that. Don't need that. Okay, I still have that open. Cool. Um, good. Oh, never mind. Here we go. Here's the um, the benchmark test number, which is the same as the master. I haven't changed how standard chess searches. Uh, it's crazy house opening book. Um, what was my message that I want to express with this? Um, get log. Yeah, we're gonna try testing this with um, the settings that were produced by the tuner, which included the don't use the pawns set thing for Crazy House. <sighs> it's embarrassing that I missed that earlier. Oh well. Um, so yeah, now we can see here's the new thing I just submitted. Um, you can see there's the code diff. Oops. Well, well, shit. Um, yeah, that's not what I intended to test. Okay. Um, let's see, I usually get something wrong each time I submit one of these. That one's pretty simple. Git checkout master. Git checkout new branch. Um, crazy house pawn count. Let's say. Git cherry pick. Uh, my other change. Um, now we have to rebuild and retest that this all compiles and stuff. The branch name is Crazy House Pawn Count. Let's start creating this. So just going to say Crazy House with the new branch name. Using the Crazy House opening book. Um, yeah, so here. Oh, I'm not logged in. I can't get rid of that branch. Um, hmm. All right, so what game am I going to play next? I'm already thinking about that because this is going to pass testing. Um, how much time do I have? Okay. I don't know, maybe I do break out KSP. It's been a while. Jeb still needs to get to the moon. Jeb has not gotten very far in my KSP. Um, push the, or test this. Uh, it's good. It's all good. Submit. Oh, wait, what? Uh, get push origin this branch, and that's going to be good then. Submit. There we go. Much better. Look at the diff. This is exactly what we intend to test. Um, Get branch, list all our branches, get branch, delete that one, get checkout master, clear. I think we're good. Um, man, I'm impressed how many... Wait, that can't possibly be right, can it? What am I looking at here? Nine machines, 99 cores. Jeez, that's incredible. 
somebody is generous or somebody works at a place where they've got computers that are idle or something but we got nine machines most of them are tanks um rather six machines each have 15 cores um i think they all have 16 and um you're only allowed to use 15 at a time for um this sort of thing my own computer um uh is able to run four threads at once um see i guess it has four cores but wow that's cool um <laughs> estimated six hours for these three this one's estimated to take one hour the thing i just submitted um that's amazing uh yeah i think i'm done coding at the moment um patch submission open nice oh hey look what uh, i haven't deleted anything okay fine oh okay eight king a5 is considered a blunder um yeah If we assume the longest force checkmate is 60 plies, then Lee just could set the half of clock accordingly. And so for this um, King A5 move, um, <laughs> wait. Stockfish evaluated this to be 80 pawns. Um, um yeah so hmm i do not know who removed and deleted a comment and i tend to agree that discussion can be constructive uh, that discussion is a useful, is constructive. Um, I think the bug is, is that uh, cloud analysis is not used in this game. Um, seems that eventually uh wait as update uh game evaluations should update and annotations should change based on um at least based on my assumptions about how cloud analysis works. Uh, game evaluations are position. Evaluations should update and game annotations should update. However, perhaps the such does not apply to from position games. Uh, hmm. I wonder.
so, but yeah, this is even assuming that an evaluation is wrong, it shouldn't remain wrong. Like if I go here and if I say figure out what the evaluation here is, and go deeper, calculate this out to a depth of 100 or however deep we need to go. I think this is already saying it's on depth 82 which I think once it cracks depth 90 um, it'll realize that this position is in fact drawn. Hopefully the stream doesn't crash while we're analyzing this. Um, what are my settings here? Uh, let's limit this to one CPU. Um, Yeah, I'm not sure. I could take a look at whether my computer's catching fire or not. Um, well, it seems like it's not. Seems like everything's okay. Um, let's max out the mem. Oh, whoa! I don't. Yeah. Wait, a gig? Yeah, maybe I've got a gig. We'll find out. How much? I freaked out there because I thought I saw something larger than a gig, but um, yeah, no, memory consumption's fine. Nothing to worry about, so we're just solving chess. Uh, let's try this again. So one CPU, all the memory, infinite analysis on. And it should come up with a conclusion at some depth that, um, you know, this isn't indeed a win. Um, I could also have my, uh, my development server try to analyze this. I'm not sure that it would get much farther, but it might. It could be a fun experiment, see which one gets there first. Um, regardless, I think the fact that we set the half move clock here to 16, rather than a greater number like 36 or 56, um, is probably what's slowing this down. Um, Yeah, and maybe maybe the board editor shouldn't allow you to supply such positions where um, it's just a draw. Or maybe if the board editor allows you to enter such a position um, and it is a forced draw, then at the time we're constructing the game, uh, set the half move clock to 100. And that way, uh, Stockfish won't be severely taxed by this. One could argue that Stockfish itself should detect this really obscure, stupid use case. Um, and it eventually does, but one could argue that it should detect it faster. And that's just a... I don't know. The fact that you would take the world's most competitive chess engine and try to change it to do something other than what it's best suited for seems ridiculous. Um, well, you know, I was initially intending to do some some gaming. However, this came along and kind of ruined my afternoon. Not really, but this provides an opportunity for me to do something better. Okay, so at least locally it remembers that this is a zero. Um, but, yeah, I need to submit a pull request so we do this analysis thing for from position games, because I don't think... or cloud analysis. I need to learn more about how this works. If I'm going to argue about how it works, I need to learn more about it. Um... Uh, 
So yeah, if I refresh this, my analysis will go away. Uh, if uh, my PC analyzes, woo, analyzes eight king a five at an evaluation of zero. However, cloud analysis is not in effect. Uh, so, <sighs> I guess we get to do some coding. I guess I'll set my stream category, etc., accordingly. Um, programming. Um, so, We'll set um, what would be some kind of ridiculous reference to put into the stream title. Um, a more sentient stockfish cloud. Uh, okay. We'll go with that. So now stream title, etc. have been updated. No longer on IRL, because we're actually going to do some coding. And this is going to be non-trivial, and it's going to push gaming until a later time, because we have something to code. Um, it's like every time I log out of this development box, um, somebody finds one more issue. And the only reason I'm going to take care of this is because I really don't think Leech's developers could be bothered to do this. Um, so we need to find... Well, while I'm doing all the analysis of the code, um, I need to first pull down the latest version. Um, get branch, show what you've got, and get checkout master. Origin master. Um, I think that's probably fine. Clear git pull upstream master into origin. Um, get stash clear. Get stash pull. Get stash apply. Um, get push. Origin master. Okay, so um, clear cat build. Uh, yeah, let's, we want to issue this to check out all the things we got to check out. So, okay, now we're going to take a look at how cloud analysis is done. I'm pretty sure that somewhere in the code we're saying we only want to do this for normal chess. And I want to say it should probably also be done for from position games. Um, so, oh, interesting. There's only like 10 pieces of code and 12 commits referencing this. Uh, cloud analysis on games. Okay. Um, interesting. Uh, cache devals as cloud, cache practice, AI, oh, wow. Really? That's pretty cool. Uh, merge cloud evals and client tree. Don't send same depth to cloud. Always send multi <laughs> revert. Better stop of local if there is a better cloud evaluation. Make sure they're playable in practice. Okay. Stop analyzing locally when cloud has an eval with a large depth. But no, where where is the cloud? How do you cloud? Um I 
I don't know. This says me, oh, wait, wait, that's UI. Are there any Scala files that do things with the cloud? No. Okay. So what gives? Um, what gives indeed? I don't understand. I do not understand. Um, there's got to be somewhere where that controls. I've been told that this is only done for standard chess. There must be somewhere in the code that controls for that. Uh, where is cloud set equal to false? <laughs> yeah, I'm so stumped. This is a good trick. <laughs> uh, Amy's client clown. Well, I guess we'll look at that code and rather than trying to make blanket statements about how this works, always send multi PV to evaluation cloud. Oh, maybe the reason that this didn't get sent had nothing to do, well, I don't know. I am so confused. Um, but okay. What if we set this to do the most possible lines and the most memory, one CPU, this position, and just tell it to go. And then if I refresh, how long does this take to solve? I am so confused. Why does this not persist? It says all of White's moves are plus 80. But they all transpose to each other, too. Um, Fail put. On cloud evaluation. Options to receive, etc., etc. Um, I just don't know. Does this have another name, like server eval? Eval cache, because uh, the server shouldn't care where it came from. Um, types, fine. Uh, client eval? Is this another name for this? Is eval better? This is TypeScript. This is still a scripting language. Would, I'm not sure. No, this still runs in the UI. Um, enable storage. Now we're talking. Um, <laughs> Client eval enabled. That's cool. Um, <laughs> it's 
So that's a local variable name for this particular setting. A setting would be established under something. Um, nope. Um, interesting. Enable storage dot get equals one and the document's not hidden. I think this has more to do with if you say your client is able to um, do engine analysis despite having an evaluation. So that's still not what we're looking for. I am just super curious where server side this is all configured. Um, I mean, all these commits seem to have nothing to do with um, the server itself. This is all JavaScript. A cloud analysis to the feature list. Yep, that's nice. Um, is that all in Elasticsoft or something? I mean, I can't believe that. It might be, but that seems absurd. Um, <laughs> Meanwhile, my server's still downloading and compiling Leechess. Issues. Okay. Wait, this... That's not it. Oh, what are all the issues for the Leechess codebase? Um, well, I may just have to resort to filing a bug, because apparently I can't figure out how to code this. Um, let me log in to do that. Uh, if I can remember how to log in. this tab back. Let's see if we've got anything new and interesting here. Um, update types.h. Okay. Huh. He had a different name a minute ago. Deleted user. Okay. Okay, that's cool. Wait, what? Conversation. Nice. Okay, so we didn't... Um, oh, I don't have that in my back buffer. Oh, never mind, we've got it here. Oh, this is table bases, not cloud analysis. Um, <laughs> um, disallow opponent's ability to add time to my clock. Oh, that's great. It's just what Lee Chess needs. It's another thing you can check. Um, yeah, that sounds cool for whisper mode. Um, okay, um, so is this done yet? Yeah. Yes. This has solved the position. Um, uh, what if I open this tab up and, or open this game up in another tab? Um, 
Yeah, it doesn't remember my analysis. Okay, so... Um, wait, can I link to this? I should be able to link to an individual move. Here we are. There's our URL. Um, new issue. Uh, cloud analysis for from position variant. Um, my computer analyzed this position to uh, with multi PV equals five and depth equals ninety nine. However, uh, upon refresh, uh, my analyses are lost. Uh, stockfish analyses. issue. Okay, copy back to forum. Um, I have filed an issue and am attempting to code a solution. Uh... <sighs> Although honestly, I, I don't have the resources to figure this out. And um, it's a generic issue that affects all from position positions. And as far as I can see, there's no reason not to allow it unless cloud analyses really don't pertain to this sort of thing. I don't know. Maybe there's only so much of the cloud. Maybe the cloud is all consumed and there's no space left. Um, another bug. Wait, what? Oh, due to plus 80. Hmm. Hmm. Why does Victorious Black loses on time? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, there's only one thing I can do here. Um, we're gonna create an issue. New issue. Solve chess. Wait, 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 no, there's some more descriptive names. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 piece table base. Solve 15 man end games. Um, uh, so, this is a legitimate issue. I'm not saying it's solvable, but um, uh, 
Okay. Where do we make a mistake? Um, king d4. King d7 is a blunder. So this is where the mistake occurs. King d6 would have held. Okay. Um, and under 25,000 buys. For ultra bullet time control. Six. Thanks. I have created an issue. There's no way in hell we're going to manage to solve it, but. You no, know, you're right. And it's definitely a bug. Why is Stockfish so bad at chess? Who knows? <laughs> Uh, okay, well that's good fun. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that I could do much to help him there without like doing something drastic that ruins Stockfish for everybody else. But okay, we got the issue, it's filed. If somebody comes up with a 15-man table base, we'll make sure uh, to create it. Um, make sure to solve that. But, you know, in the interim, perhaps that's not the best way to handle this. Uh, perhaps we can just accept that Stockfish does, in fact, blunder. Um, so. Stockfish doesn't need to be, I don't know, some sort of god that just can solve chess, period. But, um... It helps if it works in most positions. So let's go back to profile. <laughs> I mean, he's absolutely right that Stockfish should not have taken that rook there. It should not have put itself in a position where its only move was to take the rook. Um, although, even here... Well, no, I guess here, yeah, it is lost. Um, so. Yeah, 15-man table base would probably be a good thing. Um... I'm not sure how else to address this sort of concern. There might be a way to make it more resilient for this sort of thing. Um, but yeah, once it's played King D7, the game's over. Um, maybe doing a multiple null move search in positions where it's just completely dead lost. Or this sort of thing might be helpful. Um, he's conflating everything, which he's more than welcome to do. Um, I'm not blaming this loss on Leeches. I mean, I could, but where's the fun in that? How deep does this have to search to figure out that it shouldn't play the dumb move? Um, oh, I'm sorry. We don't need multi-PV search on for this. So, this is actually a pretty hard problem, detecting the fortress. Um, okay, so that took how long? I wasn't timing. I should have timed that, but I'm going to say like somewhere between 30 seconds and a minute. 
Either way, that's astronomical compared to the amount of time spent to play a move in an Ultra Bullet game. Um, this is playing without table bases, but table bases would not help here. So, yeah, I think greater usage of null move search would help with these evaluations. I'm not so concerned that Stockfish did lose this game, um, because many human players would be similarly tempted to pick up the Rook. Um, I'm just not sure where to take this next tier. Um, have to think about that. I mean, we could review like how Stockfish handle these currently. Um, it, when you have king and a lot of pieces versus just a lone king, um, maybe that's something we can better detect. Uh, if only the king is mobile. Uh, like if we have king versus... Uh, an entire army. Maybe that's something we can do something about. Um, let's switch. Let's put my tabs back together. Well, in fact, I had a session open already. But okay, here's Stockfish development as opposed to Leech's development. Um, let's see, stock or fish test or fish net. Uh, here. Get branch, we'll list what branch we're on. Get diff, shows we don't have anything locally checked out. Um, material, that CPP, I think it was. King cross X or something? I don't know. Grab King XR somewhere. Uh, case insensitive, maybe? No. Oh, this changed. Right. Um, and game net CPP, of course. So where was the use case of king versus everything? Um, because that's not going to happen in a real game, but in from position it might happen. Um. There's a special endgame evaluator for King versus the world. Um, I just don't see it here. King in many pieces versus King is here somewhere. I just don't see it. Uh, of scale, factor, Material dot gauge scale factor uh, returns a scale factor for the given color. We have to provide the position as, in addition to the color because the scale factor may also be a function which is applied to the position. In king bishop pawn versus king games, the scaling function should looks for rook pawns and looks for wrong colored bishops. Okay. Um, in material at CPP. Oh, I'm sorry, scale factor is defined entirely here. Which looks for a scale factor. Okay. Which is the data type. Okay, there's nothing declared here though. Um, any declaration that I want to look for is somewhere here. Um, so I need to see if there's a scaling factor for, um, well, there's a lot of code here for sure. Oh, okay. 
here's all the definitions of these factors. There could be a special factor for king versus the world. Um, okay. I don't see one that says the king versus the world sort of thing here, though. I don't know that it even matters. Um, scale factor... Uh, max? Um, okay, so... I'm sorry, this is the constant we need to look for. On in the seventh rank, supported from the rook behind. That's not what we're looking for, but what this does mean is that we have oh king rook pawn versus king rook. Um, okay, so what are our various scale factors? Um, I could have sworn that there was one for just a king all by itself uh, versus an armada, but I don't see such a thing. Yeah, apparently that's not a thing. Maybe that got simplified out at some point and was deemed no longer useful. Um, So I suppose I have to do some analysis of the code instead of just speculating about how it works. Um, where's the fun in that? Evaluate. Okay, so we got evaluate scale factor. Um, if we have this in the end game table base and so on and so forth, which we don't. I'm sorry, not the table base, the bit base. Um, material on H. Okay, so I think I have to go to evaluate.cpp and figure out, computes the scaling factor for the strong side. Um, oh. So. Okay, if it's normal or one pawn, check if it's opposite colored bishops and so forth. Um, else, where the weaker side can place their king in front of the opponent. Oh, here's the bug. <laughs> There's the bug that pushes the king toward the rook. Um, this is assuming a little bit too much, I think. Um, let's take a look at where scale factor normal is used. Um, Material.cpp. Okay, we don't have a specialized evaluation function. If we are playing, oh, wait, here we are. If king, is this saying if there's just a king versus king? No, if king x versus king. Grab is k x k. Yeah, material.cpp is k x k. Okay. Um, there's not more than one piece for the opponent, and we have more than a rook, is the way that that's determined. Um, then the evaluation function is equal to evaluate kxk. Evaluate kxk says... Um, Use the kxk scaling function, I guess. Um, 
which I'm pretty sure has got to be a pretty bad evaluation. Uh, wait, this is an evaluation function. This is where I put the code. Nope, nope, nope. Um, yeah, this is where I would look. Um, look for stalemate detection. This is where you would put something like fortress detection. Um, simply gives the attacking side a bonus for driving the defending king toward the edge of the board and for keeping the distance between the two kings small. That's all reasonable. Um, so, yeah. You want to add some code in here that determines whether a fortress exists. Um... Winner king square, loser king square, result is equal to non pawn material, etc. If we've got all that material, um, we still need to check for mobility. I think this is something that could potentially benefit stockfish overall. Um, Improve fortress detection. Um, sure, why not? Um, get checkout. Um, Uh, what do I want to call this? Fortress. Um, Endgame Fortress. This is going to be a new branch. So I can afford to do interesting things here. Um, let's see. So... Our evaluation would be um, if the king is not forced, if it's not Zugzwang, which is the hard part of this, is figuring out are we in Zugzwang. Here we are, because we're forced to make a capture and our opponent has no mobility. Um, Fortress detection with lone king. <sighs> Actually, yeah, put it this way. If, um, if the side to move is the strong side, and move list leak. No, if the king um, and no mobility, and you have opposition. Um, <laughs> this is involving an idea I looked at just this morning. Line BB. Um, Line BB. Line? No. Rep line and CPP. Yeah, so here's the way that that works. Um, Rep Zug swung. Uh, no. Okay. 
Well, that's too bad. Um, grab distance. We've got distance all over the place. Um, so. Um, <laughs> So we say, and if distance of um, between the kings um, is equal to two, um, and line BB of that winner king square loser king square um, winner king square loser king square is equal to two So now, how do I check if all the moves are um, king moves? Wait, does this rule work in this position? Yeah, if you have opposition, hmm, can I construct a position where um, where I don't know. where a player does not have opposition but is able to somehow regain it by force. That seems unlikely, but maybe possible. Yeah, I don't know if that's actually possible. I have to think more about that. Um, Here's evaluate. EI is an eval info. Oh dear. That's not something that doesn't make it beyond um, evaluate.cpp, isn't it? Oh, wait a second, though. Here's this evaluate scale factor thing. So... Oh, wait. Um... Where is mobility start to be defined for an eval info? I think considerably after we've you know, determined the scale factor. Um, so yeah, mobility is something we can't detect at this stage. Uh, push to close. Oh, hang on. Um, delete these four lines and put them down here. Okay. Hmm. 
result is the minimum of result plus win versus mate and max. Oh, okay. I think I have to discard this way of trying to code it. Get check out. Um, instead, we have to look here. Um, and see that after we've determined the scale factor, um, this, I don't know. Turn the scale factor, fine. At this point, we don't know very much about the position. Interpolate between middle game and end game. Um, yeah, so this mobility evaluation's got to change everything. Um, And we've got to add something in here that says if one player's not at all mobile, um, where is this defined though? Okay, so eval in it. It's called well in advance of asking for. Well, no. Now here we check, is there a specialized evaluation? Probe our material bit base, check for K. Um, evaluate kings. this brace end? Okay, here. Um, so if a player has no space, I think that's the issue. Um, how do we do evaluate space? Um, it's based on the number of safe squares available for minor pieces, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's equal to space mask, not not occupied by our pawns, um, not attacked by their pieces. Um, mm -hmm. Wait, so this space mask thing. Oh, hang on. Space mask does not include the top or bottom ranks. Um, so if we have no safe spaces, find all square jumps, three behind some friendly pawn. Yeah, if we have some kind of retarded fortress thing going on. Um, hmm. I'm not sure. Oh, but this doesn't check for mobility. It's great to evaluate for space, but you only want to do this um, if you have some mobility. Yeah, this is something you could change. Yeah. 
if um, ei.mobility. I don't know how to say this. Um, oh, there's a thing called mobility, in fact. Um, um, mobility, what? That's not what I'm looking for. Actually, this might work too. Neither player has any mobility. Uh... Oh, I can't do it there though, because that section code is only enabled if we have horde chess. Um... Whereas this can say and um, mobility. White or mobility black. Um, but where was mobility evaluated? Evaluate pieces. area how is this established mob mob is equal to what Bitboard handed with our mobility area. Bitboard is equal to what's attacked and not occupied by our pieces. Um, so what affects the score that we're returning here? Presumably it's all mobility based. Bonus for this piece is a king protector. Ew. I don't know that I like that. It's going to complicate. Well, no, that doesn't change mobility, though. Um. Mobility is to include the mobility bonus based on the variant, piece type, and MOB. Okay, so mobility bonus. Um, mobility bonus. Damn. Okay, that's going to return a non zero value no matter what. Mm, how do you check if a player has pieces that can move? So the first element is based on if I have no mobility um, for knight, that's negative, that's negative, that's negative, this is negative. Um, so if either, if the sum of their mobilities is greater than zero, um, probably more accurate. It's still possibly a position with very low mobility, however. Um, hmm, 
so yeah, I need a different way to check this. Uh, it's like I need a specialized eval based on do I have a legal move. Um, let's take a look at the move generator. Do I have a non-capture is what I need to look for. Um, or hell, even a capture would work, but just a non-king move. Do I have a progress move of some sort, I guess? Um, Even that's not good enough, though, because you get a bishop that can shuffle back and forth in the corner. And still, that'd be equal. Um, so... Um, can generate moves for a given generation type. Um... I'm just trying to think of, like, how would you know if a player could make a move that might potentially make progress? It's hard to do from the move generator. Um, so back to end games. Yeah, this is quite messy. What you need to do is check, um, do I have, if I took my king off of the board, would I have a legal move? This is what you're trying to check for. Um, doesn't really matter whose side it is if there's no legal moves. Um, I'm just trying to think, what would you do? Yeah, this is more complicated than checking if a player has no moves. Um, Um, and it doesn't even have to be a lone king either. That's what complicates this. I'll be right back while I think about this. Uh, still lost in thought. 
Oh, well, here's a thought. Um, if the weaker side has um, multiple legal moves, um, then you want to do something about this evaluation. Um, uh, so, I don't know. If we have um, greater than four legal moves, we're doing well. Um, but no, how do I say if I have opposition? Um, no. Here's how we do it. The move is the strong side and um, move list progress dot size um, um, <laughs> result is now half of what it used to be. If we have no moves that make progress, which would be a pawn move or a capture, um, um, then yeah. I guess that applies to both players. It doesn't matter whose move it is, but I guess it's more important if it's stronger. Yeah, in fact, the weaker player can't move, that's a bad thing. Um, but how do I check, like, do I have something that's not a king move? Um, if the size is less than uh, six. No. I still want to check, like, is there a way to see um, if I have something that's not a king move. Um, let's take a look at the move generator again. Oh, I'm sorry, not at the actual generator, but at the interface for it. Uh, captures, quiets, quiet checks, evasions, non-evasions. Uh, how do we define non-evasions? Um, all pseudo-legal captures and non-captures. Oh, but for non-evasions to work, we can't be in check. Um, that's okay. Um, in fact, yeah, that's all we do in the case anyway. So yeah, checking for legal is fine. Um, I do want to create a new type then. Um, hmm. uh, how do I say? I'm sorry, a king move by itself, even if a player can only move their king. That can be useful. Um, yeah, this isn't a move generator question. It really isn't.
Oh, I see. Because the move generation takes a while, so we only bother doing that in the case where, um, yeah, the, the weaker side is on move. Never mind. This sort of thing would slow Stockfish down way too much. Um, I'm still struggling to understand why... Well, I guess I haven't looked at this, have I? Um, let's take a look. Why would Stockfish select King d7? Um, you know, we don't need the Lee Chess tab open anymore. We're stuck in Stockfish at the moment. Um, so... In test position FEN this go depth twenty two. The depth might be the actual problem. Um, so um, oh, that combined with a time management routine could potentially be an issue. Um, uh, move time one second. Move time one tenth of a second. Move time much faster than that. Ten milliseconds. Okay, so it takes the bait at ten milliseconds. But why would it do that? What's so appealing about that? 7,000 nodes. Um, well, huh. <laughs> um, So the side to move is the weak side. Then um, if the strong side is the side to move, return result. Return minus result. But yeah, if we have... Um, only one legal move... Um, Uh, let's see, is that true? It's less than or equal to two. Yeah, this is true. This should hold. Um, Let's compile that and see how terrible an idea that is. Um, it's possible this might even improve Stockfish overall, though most of my ideas... Well, okay, apparently I don't have the compile command here. Make, build, um, let's see. Now, obviously, this wasn't a make profile build, so it might perform worse than a profile build would. Or it might perform better. Um, it's hard to tell. Come on. Compile, damn it. Compile faster. I want to see my test result. Alright, so. Yeah, so it no longer takes the bait at 10 
Um, what bugs me here is that um, the compiler has to know to retain this value of the number of legal moves for purposes of this comparison down here. Um, ay, 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 ay. So, um, oh, plus, you know, this, I'm doubling what might be invalid for me to double. Um, so I need to do this earlier, say up here. Um, Is this going to work? Is there a more efficient way for me to do something like this? Non pawn material and um, strong side has pawns and we're being pushed. Um, So, 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 what now? I mean, ultimately, this sort of thing isn't so critical because this kind of endgame, one of the players is clearly winning anyway. Um, it would be nice to get this right. To push to edges and push to corners. Um, hmm. Oh, of the correct color. Okay, I get it, I get it. So that's the point. To drive a piece toward or away from another piece. Push away. How does this work? Distance between the king and knight. Um, oh, wait, is this something used elsewhere? King rook versus king knight. King x king. Um, king queen king. Hmm. Uh, based on the distance between the kings, is there any pushing going on? Zero five twenty. Um. Yeah, I'm not sure. Where do we do push? Push to edges, corners, close, and away. Okay, so yeah, regardless... Push close will give greater bonuses based on how close things are. Um, struggling with here is that suppose you have a rook 
Um, no, I think this statement probably holds true even then. If some pieces other than your king are forcing your opponent's king to move. Um, I just want to know, like, if I change this from less or less than or equal to two to just um, equal to one, um, I want to know if this result still holds. Um, it seems like a much more limiting condition, perhaps not as generally applicable, but if the opponent has only two moves. then they're not in a very good position. <laughs> if they have only one move, um, that's potentially Zugspong. But yeah, if you have them like pinned to a back rank or pinned to a corner or something of that nature. Um... Oh, wow. So now it reliably picks king f5 every time um, by 10 milliseconds. Whereas earlier, uh, earlier it rejected king d7 pretty quickly. It took slightly longer to reject king d7 here. Um, I think I like my first formulation better. Are there positions where um, king having two legal moves would be better? Well, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. This might... Um, I'm not sure what to say about any of this. Doubling the result is a pretty strong thing to do. Um, no, I think this way I originally had it is more accurate, though. I'm overfitting if I say less than or equal to two. This, um, this could be yeah. Um, possible Zug spawn with Lone King. Which is pretty scary for the Lone King. Um, I highly, highly doubt that this is going to work in most positions, but it only applies to positions where one king or one player has just a king remaining, um, which honestly shouldn't come up in training games that often. Um, I am curious how this would perform in general. How do I speed this up further, I wonder? I mean, this doesn't have to be... Um, you could have other positions where the king has only just a single move. There are plenty of positions where this applies. Although here we're talking about like an armada attacking a king. This would not be used for, say, king rook versus king or king bishop bishop versus king. This would be like king and three bishops versus a king. Um, and so I'm not even sure why this routine exists. Um, 
Oh, hang on. This is also incorrect. This should not return here. This is what it should do, is multiply the result. And then say, before bounding it as is done below. Um, so if the strong side has a queen or a rook, or bishop and knight, or two bishops, um, and then set that the result is either a known win or a mate in max ply. Um, I wonder why. Why is that the case? Known win. Well, okay, yeah, we're starting from baseline of a known win. Um, but yeah, that value is not to exceed um, checkmate. That's the point. Okay. Uh, um. So I guess I trust the compiler to optimize this. Um, <laughs> a naive thing to do would be, well, first we got to check, is the benchmark the same? Of course it is. Second of all, um, um, does this change performance? I dislike new FIDE rules. I suspect they're really bad in some aspects. Okay, well, sure. You're welcome. There are some insights for him. I mean, yeah, so I guess he finds this discussion enjoyable in some way. And he has suspicion, but... Um, It's just difficult to comment on. I mean, that's just a matter of taste. I, for the longest time, thought that this is a, that the um, particular rules where a king and knight or a king and bishop can win on time didn't seem to make much sense. But then, if you put an increment on the game, none of it matters. So. And yet, like if you have a king and a pawn, okay, yeah, that pawn's more likely to promote, but there are other positions too where um, that king and pawn, uh, the pawn is blockaded. Uh, there's absolutely no way that that pawn's going to promote, and yet people be like, yeah, but I have a pawn, so I win. Um, so, I don't know. Oh, but so I need to check, does this change the bench number? Very unlikely, because this should, the bench doesn't test this particular position. Or anything even remotely resembling it. No, oh, no it does. It does test, um, that's crazy. Um, Get diff, show us the diff. Get add endgame. Get commit. Wait, let's take a look at the endgame. What did I change? Um, get 
commit. Um, and possible Zugspong detection to end game. Evaluation. Okay. Um, get checkout master just to demonstrate that the bench has changed. I mean, we saw that this number is 6, 8, whatever. Uh, make build. Endgame Fortress. Um, Endgame Fortress is the wrong name for that. Um, that should be different. I didn't think that the test coverage included positions anywhere remotely similar to what we were just looking at, but I'm apparently mistaken. So just from the master branch, we should get a benchmark number that's like 7 million something. Yeah. Get check out this. Get check out branch and game. KXK subs. Um, I don't need to say end game, do I? Block. Okay. Um, get checkout master. Get log. So yeah, this number is the same number. Um. Well. That changes things considerably now, doesn't it? Um, benchmark? Um, there's no way that I could have discovered something that hundreds of other developers missed. Five-man positions, six-man positions, seven-man, neat and stalemate. Um, okay, so what I need to test is... Um, for each one of these positions, is the benchmark the same? The easiest way to test that would be to comment out the first part of the test. Well, uh, yeah. F0. Hang on. Let's do this on my branch. Get branch. List my branches. Get branch delete um, the what was it? Endgame fortress is a misnomer. Get check out this. Um, Uh, so now we want to take a look at benchmark and see with and without the changes what's going on. Mate and stalemate positions. Okay. Um, so make build. This test should finish very quickly. We should find almost immediately the checkmates and um, stalemates and such. Um, yeah, I guess the thing to watch out for is if a player has only one legal move, does that mean that we should penalize that necessarily? I don't know. Um, in any event, we can run this test. If 
14. Oh, those are all mates. There's nothing to be seen there. Um, okay, let's throw in five man, six man, seven man. See if we come up with the right answers. If these do produce the right answers, then maybe this is a test worth submitting. Um, okay, so 640 milliseconds, 1 million nodes. Um, so the comments that we were looking at in the benchmark said um, King c2, Knight a2, Rook e5, King a2. Did we come up with those moves? King c2, knight a2, rook e5, king a2. Uh, best move b1, c2. Best move c1, a2. I have a sense that we missed the boat. Oh, king c2, knight a2, yeah, c1, a2, something e5, something a2. So, first one, king c2, yep, knight a2, yep. Uh, this evaluates as 1045, that's not a draw. Um... Rook e5, yep. King c2, yep. Um, this also evaluates as not a draw. So now if I strip out the change... Um, let's see. Test one, that text. Okay, fine. Um, also redirect standard error. Cool. All right, so now we go on to uh, Zugswang, Zugswang. Say if zero and if. Let's put a blank line above and below that. Compile. Let's see. Do we still end up with a million nodes? And if so, do we get the same evaluations? And if so, we're good. That's interesting that they put some draws into the test suite. and expect, I don't know, what, know exactly what they expect to see there, other than just the, the benchmark numbers don't change. All right, so s diff test one to test two. All right, the benchmark increases for test two. Um, We say like width 140. Okay, that's not wide enough. Here we go. That's too wide. Um, still too wide. Let's just do 150. All right, so what changed? Uh, not a lot. All the numbers are the same here. Um, numbers are the same there. Uh, came up with the same result 
Yeah, all the Cenopon values are the same. It's just that something else changed. Ten forty-five. Um, yeah, this just simply looks like a speed up. Now the danger is overfitting for some very very specific. Oh, position five. Look at that. Four fourteen versus four oh eight. I say that's within some tolerance. That doesn't matter. Yeah, this is something worth trying. Uh, get diff. Um, get log. Diff just says I put some if zero things in here. Yeah, let's push this and see how it goes. So get push origin. King X, King Zuxwang. In almost every position, that's going to make very little difference. Uh, in some very select positions, it might matter. But those seem to be the positions he's interested in, so what you going to do? Um, test signature. Oh, right, so the test signature changes. Um, status, get checkout, benchmark, and endgame. Um, yeah, let's run the whole gamut here. Um, okay, make build. Going to be testing chess, and I guess all we need is just the benchmark number. Because we've already looked at the end game evaluations, which are the only positions where these changes would take effect, and there doesn't seem to be any problem. So, all looks good. Oh, yeah, good. I'm not muted. All right, stockfish bench. So the key question is, in self-play, does this significantly help or not? Um, get check out master. Build the stuff and get the benchmark. Oh, did I get my commit message? I don't think I did. Well, so we'll have to get it this way. Um, here's my commit message. Right. Oh, is that still compiling? Oh, good. It did finish. Okay, so we're going to submit this with the add possible Zugsvang. Um, possible speed up. Um, Bench uh, reduced. So wait, what's the ratio here? What's the ratio of those two numbers? Just for my own edification. The larger divided by the smaller. is equal to 2%. That's a 
2% bench decrease. Um, I expect this will either go very well or fail hideously. We'll see. See, if it were simply a speed up and didn't change the bench, that would be simpler to merge, but it's not. Um, be impressed if you could get machine. Yeah, right. Is there a problem that can not be solved um, by dumb retrograde search? Huh. I don't know. I am not suggesting that I implement FIDE rules. Um, I am suggesting, and we'll go back to the thing I keep repeating over and over and that he's just simply not acknowledging, which is a rule that is very similar to the FIDE rules. Um, It is true this bears some similarity to FIDE, to current FIDE rules. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, however, such rules, however, um, Uh, it's because a because twice a day a broken clock this is because even a broken clock is correct twice a day and um, this particular subset of the feed a rules um, this particular rule um, is fair is both simple no I can't even say simple because this particular rule um, I don't know particular rule works well. Such as FIDE. Now, this particular rule works well. Yeah. And you because even FIDE acknowledges this is because um, I am not at all suggesting implementing more FIDE rules as many of the FIDE rules are wholly in, uh, um, if players, um, the same players who complain about this rule 
do not complain about positions like um, now where's that thing that Loveless posted? Ah, players, he made a forum post. Um, I'm sorry, that was not Loveless, it was Asios who made a post recently. Um, can I even get this? Yeah. Um, let's grab this. My immediate reaction um, to this particular rule was the same as yours, and it took um, was only after much dis, uh, consideration that I realized the problem is not with the rule. Um, skepticism. And concern. After much consideration Realize the problem is not that there is no problem with the rule, only with the time control as playing even with a plus one increment could um, would entirely fix. Um, having no increment, only with the fact that no increment chess and plus one or greater increment chess are have different strategies. We require different time management skills. There we go. It's not even that the objective is different, it's just that So do we still have that other thread open? Um, so I created a new branch. I submitted a test. I might have that test open here somewhere. If I don't, um, apparently I don't have that open anymore. That's okay, we can go there pretty quickly. Um, submitted a test which
appears to fix this, which appears to improve stockfish end game play in uh, lost um, in such positions. Okay, copy that, because the next step is to the forum, where I enter this issue. Uh, submit that, so everybody's on the same page. Okay, what's new now? Um, don't care about that at the moment. I think that resolves it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I think all the forum topics have been answered, all the open questions. Can I watch replays of my games? Yep. Yep, you can. Can I... Okay, is this puzzle bugged? Um, I think there are two solutions. I'm accepting that answer because Q&A, you asked a question, you got an answer. That's the format. If you wanted to really discuss something, you would have brought it to the forum. Um, unable to join in tournament, unable to join in tournament. Um, wait, are these the same thing? Okay, can I... Delete one of these. Okay, because only because he's posted the same thing exactly twice. Um, um, anything else? Or are we good? I think we're good, guys. Swiss tournaments. That was a fun point of discussion. Oh, this is the thing I was intending to address like two hours ago. But yeah, I'm intending to inspire discussion of Swiss tournaments on Lee Chess. Um, I think they're cool. I think they help players improve, help players find opponents at similar skill levels and devote time to playing games and have discussion or food or breaks or whatever between rounds is to play optimally during the games. Swiss is a great idea. It just takes a lot of work. Um, and so now we're trying to identify requirements for implementing that. How about a Monrad Swiss system? Uh, Monrad? Who's, who's Monrad? Uh, can't say I know that. Monrad system. Uh, program is simple and easy to learn. Oh, it's just a Swiss system director. Okay. Thanks for the information. I have no comment. Um, Um, so yeah, we'll see if the test gets approved. I'd approve it myself, but it's, I mean, let me hit the approve button. I don't think this is going to let me do anything, and yeah, I can't do it. Didn't think so. Um, so, yeah. This decreases the bench, which means it's quite possible in a number of other positions. Um, it might be thinking the position zigs Wong when it really isn't. Um, but you know, never know. Maybe it actually helps. Maybe those positions where it would hurt the engine are so far, few and far between that this might make sense upstream. I could always bother them about it. Um, Um, kind of surprised they didn't think about it, but I don't know. Um, 
You know, if this passes testing on the short time control, I think I'll reach out to other developers and ask them, is this something I should patch upstream or suggest upstream or what? Um, because that seems like a ridiculous savings. It doesn't seem reasonable at all. Um, I mean, if one player has only a king, that's like very, very, very few positions that Stockfish will ever be in. It's upstream, they surely wouldn't want this. It would only improve play in positions where a player were already lost. Um, on the other hand, I don't know. Possible Zugzwang detection might help them figure out some positions that look lost and they aren't sure about. Hard to say. I mean, you really don't need an accurate evaluation of those positions, but... Oh, I should check on um, the bug I filed at the beginning of the stream, which was... Um, at, at, uh, cloud position for from analysis. Yeah, it's still out there. So I still have to figure this out. Beats me at the moment. I'm not sure what to do about this. Time will tell. Time will tell. Anyhow. Um, yeah, I'll have to play some games later. Maybe even chess. Who knows? So, hope you enjoyed watching. Take care. And uh, see you next time.